Hello, I'm Masahiro Sakurai, director of Kid Icarus Uprising. This may be a bit sudden, but I'd like to start by introducing the game's multiplayer modes. First, we have Light vs. Dark, a 3 vs. 3 battle. When a team's life gauge is depleted, a powerful angel appears. The last player to lose a life becomes the angel for their team. Victory is achieved by defeating the other team's angel. This time we've added narration to the video. The battle you're about to see plays out in a flurry of offense and defense like Smash Brothers. Okay, roll the tape. Let's introduce the teams in today's Light vs. Dark match. The Light team features Beam Claws, Fairy Orbitars, and a Twin Bellows Cannon. And the opposing Dark team comes with an Insight Staff, Black Club, and Bowl Arm. Okay, there's our mystery bonus. And ready? Go! From the get-go, we see a Mega Laser power activated. Both teams are now on the move. Notice the square cursor displayed on enemies? That indicates an enemy is within firing range. Here we see Black Club riding grind rails and firing giant steel balls. Both are unique to this map. It looks like Beam Claws is trying to get in close on the bowl arm. These particular Beam Claws have paralysis properties. And the Black Club has been turned to stone but he takes advantage of the chaos and defeats Beam Claws. When you're defeated, the team's health diminishes according to the value of your weapon. Activating super speed, Fairy Orbitars quickly advances on the opponent. Bolarm has respawned and is making his way up to the central island. Twin Bellows Cannon sees an opportunity to attack. We see him knock his opponent off the edge with authority for an easy defeat. With their team health depleted, the Dark Team is now slightly behind. But Bolarm has returned for revenge, bringing the two teams even. Here we see the Insight Staff on the run. Beam Claws takes note and pursues. Beam Claws can't find him, and there he goes. He's left the scene. It is definitely in the Insight Staff's best interest to get distance on opponents. But Beam Claws takes advantage of excellent foot speed to close the gap. An opponent on a grind rail is an easy target. When your team's health is exhausted, your team angel appears. The team who defeats the opponent's angel wins. Beam Claws has been inflicted with darkness. He's temporarily blinded. He's activated a super speed power to escape the darkness. Now the Insight Staff uses playing dead. He escapes the scene invisible, having pretended to die. Meanwhile, Fairy Orbitars is on the receiving end of a lethal melee combo. This brings the team health to zero, which means Fairy Orbitars will appear as Pit. Notice that the team health bar is replaced by the Angel's health bar. He's in good position now to use an explosive flame power. Engulfed in flames, Bolarm is robbed of his health, defeated, and will now become Dark Pit. Both teams' angels are on the playing field. Pit has been poisoned. Both teams are trying to protect their own angel while defeating the opponents. Here we see the Insight Staff zoomed in for a sniping opportunity. He's looking for Pit and lands a shot. Dark Pit is taking damage from a Fierce Claw combo, but a Black Club shot saves him. If you're an Angel, your health will decrease slightly when your teammates are defeated. The Flames have worked down Pit's health to dangerous levels. He's barely hanging on. Meanwhile, Dark Pit is hiding on the Central Island. But here comes Beam Claws. Beam Claws turns a Slash into a brutal combo. Dark Pit has been knocked off the edge. The Light Team wins, courtesy of a fine finishing combo from Beam Claws. Beam Claws is awarded with a mystery bonus, a virus power. And a burst blade is awarded as well. Thanks for tuning in, everyone.
How was it? It might seem a bit chaotic at first, but it's a lot of fun once you get the hang of it. While it didn't appear in the battle you just saw, I'd like to tell you about an item called Daybreak. Collecting all three of the Daybreak parts will create an ultimate weapon capable of firing a single super powerful shot. The Daybreak can turn a battle around in an instant, so collecting all three parts can be a key to victory. Multiplayer mode can also be played over the internet. While testing the game, I've played against players in both North America and Europe. Also, while we've shown you a match of 3 versus 3 this time, there's also a free-for-all mode. The three elements that decide victory in this game are weapons, powers, and items. Weapons in particular are so distinct, you could almost say each one is like a separate character. Not only is there a wide variety of weapons, but each one has its own unique strength and skills. In other words, its own set of unique abilities. For example, some have powerful forward dash attacks, while others have excellent homing ability. Each one is unique. You'll want to think carefully about which weapon will best help you outweigh your enemies. Each weapon also has a particular value. The stronger the weapon, the higher its value. In multiplayer, the value of your weapon determines how much your team health gauge drops when you're defeated, so more powerful weapons aren't always the best choice. However, in single player, it is best to use a powerful weapon. As you clear levels in single player mode, you'll acquire a variety of weapons, but the power of these weapons will vary depending on the intensity you're playing at. Now I'll offer a brief explanation of single player mode. While Pit is an angel who can't fly, the power of flight grants him the ability for five minutes as he heads towards his next battleground. These are air battles. After that, he lands on the ground and heads towards the boss. These areas are land battles. Then comes the boss battle, when you take on the boss. These three battles combine to make a single chapter. Next, the Fiend's Cauldron is an extremely important element in Kid Icarus Uprising. Here, I'll play the game to show you. When you start a chapter, the more hearts, which function like currency that you pile on, the more the intensity will rise. As it goes up, so does the intensity of your enemies, but also the rewards you can earn. For example, this is Intensity 2.0. It's pretty laid back. You can defeat enemies one after another as they appear. But if you set it to 9.0, the enemies are incredibly strong. This is tough. As you raise the intensity, the items you receive will be that much better. And you won't just get better weapons, you'll earn more hearts as well. But if you lose all your health, the Fiend's Cauldron tips over and some of your hearts will spill out. If you choose to continue, the intensity level will automatically decrease so you'll be able to clear the chapter if you keep at it. But the strength of the weapons you earned will drop and you'll also lose whatever hearts you wagered. In other words, while you want to avoid tipping over the Fiend's Cauldron, it's best to clear chapters at the highest intensity that you can manage. I recommend raising the intensity slowly, without taking on too much at once. You'll have plenty of time to take on chapters at a higher intensity once you've developed a strategy and learned where enemies appear. Additionally, you can lower the intensity as well. At 0.0, .0 you're basically invincible, but you have to pay hearts. Now let me give you just a couple of tips for air battles. Basically, if you fly in a large circular pattern, you can avoid most of the enemy shots. You'll be fine if you just rotate continually like this and shoot without overthinking it. But when you raise the intensity level, this tactic won't be enough to keep you safe. At times like that, I recommend taking a break from shooting. When you're shooting, most weapons slow you down by about 75%. So there are times when it may be better not to shoot. There are some weapons, like claws, which are naturally faster, 
and orbitars that don't slow you down. Using a club is another option. Its reach may be short, but by just swinging it around, you can knock enemy shots back where they came from. And when all else fails, you can always use a special attack. Next, let me introduce the powers we saw earlier in the multiplayer match. These are limited-use special abilities you can take with you, and they can be used in both single-player and multiplayer modes. In single-player, though, you'll only use them during land battles. Touch the icons in the bottom left corner of the touchscreen, or use the plus control pad to select and use them. When deciding which ones to bring with you, you'll have to fit them into a panel. It's a bit like packing a lunchbox. They come in all shapes and sizes, so you'll have to fit them in well. Once you've chosen the powers you want, you can tap a button to autofill the rest. In multiplayer, you can create weapon and power sets in advance so you'll be ready to jump right into battle. I should mention there are other ways to get new weapons. One of the more distinct ways of getting them is through fusion. Here you can combine two weapons to produce one with even greater power. When fusing weapons, some of their attributes and skills can be carried over. For example, you could fuse a short-range weapon with a long-range bonus, or create a weapon that particularly excels at melee attacks. The game also uses Street Pass functionality. Using Street Pass, you can create items called Weapon Gems. Weapon Gems will be created from the weapons you have, and you'll exchange these gems with other people as you pass them. Creating weapon gems won't actually cause you to lose weapons. You can use the gems you got from people to fuse weapons or receive the weapon in the gem, but this will cost you some hearts. You can also grind weapon gems up to earn a few hearts. Additionally, we plan on sending out one weapon seed per day via spot pass. Finally, let me show you what comes packed in with Kid Icarus Uprising. First, there will be six AR Idol cards. When you scan them, you'll receive character models called Idols, and you can even make them battle. The cards you'll receive are decided at random, so it might be fun to compare cards with your friends. And there's one more thing, the Nintendo 3DS stand. This is it. It's a simple stand, but it's handy for games such as this that use the stylus and circle pad simultaneously. Of course, the stand also allows you to use only the stylus or hold the system with both hands while keeping a clear 3D image. The stand can also be conveniently folded down, making it quite compact. You can, of course, play Kid Icarus Uprising like this, so choose the play style that works best for you. Also, I plan to explain more about the ideas behind multiplayer mode and the Fiend's Cauldron in Iwata Asks. The game launches March 23rd, and I hope you're looking forward to it. Thank you very much.